Welcome to video lecture number seven of ICJ's course on litigating before you and treaty bodies. In this video, we'll look at formulating the request for remedies in a complaint submitted to the UN treaty bodies, having already touched upon the importance of the remedies request in video number six. The remedy request in human rights cases submitted to the treaty bodies might be different to your day-to-day -day cases in domestic courts. One reason why you approach the treaty body might be because they can and do order broader measures of reparation than the domestic courts and have a mandate to also order general measures of reparation designed to avoid repetition of the violation. This also means that measures of reparation go beyond compensation, which is often the standard and only form of reparation awarded at national level, next to the investigation and where there is sufficient evidence prosecution and conviction of the perpetrator. Given that treaty bodies will apply international law, they will have regard to and, if they find that a violation has been committed, also award measures of reparation in line with international standards, such as those expressed in the UN Basic Principles and Guidelines on the rights to a remedy and reparation, which I also reference in the notes to this video. These reparative measures depend on the treaty articles that have been violated but can include restitution, which can, for example, mean restoration of someone's employment, compensation, so that would be compensation for concrete material or moral harm as a result of the violation, rehabilitation, which can, for example, include medical care, satisfaction, including the right to know the truth, requesting the state to investigate the alleged violations, and guarantees of non-repetition, which are the broader, more general measures of reparation and may include law and institutional reform. At the outset of taking a case to a treaty body, we'll need to discuss in detail with the client about their expectations and the type of remedies they would want us to request and that they require in light of the harm suffered. Rather than managing their expectations, we'll need to understand what the expectations are see to what extent they can be met and then discuss what is possible. Unfortunately, as we will also see in the next video of this course on implementation, state parties frequently do not fully comply with decisions of treaty bodies and it is possible that none of the requested measures of reparation will actually be implemented. So this is also an important point to raise in our discussion with the client. However, low implementation notwithstanding, Making a detailed request for remedies is a key part of the litigation process and this is only possible if you have a good understanding of what the client wants. It is therefore important to have this discussion early on and to make sure, where possible, to share the draft remedy request with the client prior to submission. The remedy request should very much be an integral part of the litigation planning rather than an afterthought where we want to go beyond the individual case and also request general remedies, these should be discussed with the client. It is, after all, their case that is submitted to the treaty body. It may help the client to understand that even if the state refuses to fully implement a decision from the treaty bodies, a decision finding that the state was responsible for the alleged violation will be made public and it puts the state responsibility on the record. It will be made clear that it is the state who is responsible and not the victim, irrespective of any potential claims to the contrary from state authorities. Treaty body approach to remedies. When the treaty body finds that a state party is responsible for violations of the relevant treaty, it issues its views, basically its decision, which includes setting out measures designed to make full reparation to the victims. Notwithstanding the importance of the remedies or measures of reparation awarded by the treaty body, most of the treaty bodies and including the Human Rights Committee have much to improve when it comes to the formulation of relevant requests. If you look at decisions or views of treaty bodies, you'll see that in the majority of cases, the requested measures of reparation are generic, broad and lack sufficient detail. This is problematic as it does not do justice to the individual experiences of the victim, but also because generic recommendations do not provide sufficient guidance to the state to reform its legal and institutional frameworks where this might be required. More specificity in the recommendations would help the state and make it more difficult to avoid implementation. This in turn also requires us as representatives of victims to provide such specificity in our submissions. This brings us to formulating the request for reparation. 
When drafting the submission for a specific award of reparation, you may want to start by asking the treaty body to first make a finding of the violations alleged and to declare that the state party is responsible for violating the client's rights enshrined in the relevant treaty, as you had also argued in the submission. This may then be followed by requesting individual and general measures, always bearing in mind the individual circumstances of the case, the harm suffered and the root causes for the violation. You should show how specific measures you are requesting will help to remedy the harm suffered by your client, fulfill your client's rights and contribute to the prevention of future violations. Let's look at different measures in turn. Restitution. Depending on the facts of the case, you may want to request measures of restitution where this is required and possible so as to restore the victim to the original situation before the violation has occurred. Past measures of restitution requested by the Human Rights Committee included, for example, where the victim was unlawfully detained in violation of Article 9 of the ICCPR, the review by national authorities of the reasons for the deprivation of liberty or asking the state party to release the victim. It may also include restoration of employment or return to one's place of residence. It is also of course possible that your client does not require any measures of restitution, in which case you would not make any such requests. Compensation. One of the most common forms of reparation awarded by the treaty bodies includes compensation. Generally, they do not specify the amount of compensation owed, but may instead expressly state that compensation should cover both material and moral or non-material harm suffered as a result of the violation. So you may want to submit a request for compensation, but at least at the stage of formulating your request, you do not need to specify the amount of compensation you are seeking. Even if you do specify the amount, in my experience, at least the Human Rights Committee will not follow that request for a specific amount and simply award compensation, leaving it up to the parties to agree on the amount. Even without specifying the amount, the victim may want to highlight in some detail what they believe compensation should cover. This could include, for instance, requesting compensation for physical and mental harm, as well as for lost opportunities, including employment and education opportunities. You may want to show, by reference to the victim's testimony and where available supporting documentation, that the victim had planned to follow a specific educational course or to take up a specific profession and how what has happened to him or her prevented them from pursuing this path. Rehabilitation. Where the victim suffered physical or mental harm as a result of the violation, the request for reparation should also include measures of rehabilitation. This in could include costs from full medical and psychological rehabilitation, including social and legal services. You could refer to the severity of the violations committed, the impact these had on the victim as documented in the victim's testimony and where it exists relevant findings of the medical legal report. Measures of satisfaction. The treaty bodies also usually award measures designed to provide satisfaction to victims of human rights violations. Such measures of satisfaction include key components of justice for victims, such as public acknowledgement of wrongdoing, their right to know the truth and accountability of perpetrators. Treaty bodies may, for example, request that their decisions be published, that the state issues a public apology, and, depending on the circumstances of the case, that the state conduct a prompt, thorough and independent investigation into the violations with a view to bringing those responsible to justice. In cases of enforced disappearance, measures of satisfaction may additionally include the request to the state to search, locate and release the disappeared or to return the remains in cases of death. Guarantees of non-repetition. Victims' right to reparation also includes the right to be guaranteed non-repetition of the acts they suffered. These guarantees can include requests that the states change their legal and institutional frameworks and to align them with international standards. Human rights training of state authorities found to be responsible for their violations and improvements in conditions in places of detention in line with international standards. In strategic litigation cases, it will be particularly important to be very specific about the types of measures you require to guarantee non-repetition of the violations. 
the Committee Against Torture highlighted, for example, that guarantees of non-repetition offer important potential for the transformation of social relations that may be the underlying causes of violence and may include amending relevant laws, fighting impunity, and taking effective preventative and deterrent measures. So where a particular law or police force was responsible for the violations, highlight the relevant provision or identify the police force in the request for remedies. This is a brief overview of the types of remedies you can request, subject to what the victim seeks and what the treaty body can direct the state to do. It might be helpful in practice to develop a table with columns describing the harm suffered, the articles of the treaty violated, the evidence in support of the harm suffered and of the alleged violations, and the remedies we request in regard to each. This can help ensure that the identification of remedies and the thinking through of submissions requesting those remedies are always linked to the submissions setting out the complaint and alleged violations. This brings me to the end of video number seven on the request for remedies. I hope it became clear that remedies and the request for adequate reparation are an important component of the litigation process and need to be prepared just as diligently as, for example, submissions on the admissibility and merits of a particular case. The more detailed our submission for remedies, the more likely it is that the treaty body will request detailed remedies from the state in cases where it finds that a violation has been committed. This, in turn, will make it easier for us to work on the implementation of the decision. We'll look at that in the next video.